I can't thank everybody enough for your patience. Um, my name is Molly Day, and I'm the VP of Public Affairs here at NSBA. Um, <clears throat> let me do the fix the screen share so everybody can see the presentation okay. And is that coming through on everybody's screen? Todd, can you all see that okay? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, again, my name is Molly Day. I'm a VP here of uh, Public Affairs for the National Small Business Association. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for our conversation about uh, COVID. And we really want to focus the most of our time on taking your questions. Um, with that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to um, some of our great experts who are joining us today. Um, first, we're going to hear from Todd McCracken, who'll give us a quick update on where things stand. Then we'll hear from uh, Marilyn Landis, the owner of Basic Business Concepts, a company providing CFO level advice to small firms. Then we'll hear from Keith Ashmus, owner of Dispute Away LLC, a conflict resolution and HR consulting firm. And finally, we'll hear from Gary Kushner, owner of Kushner Company, a leading HR and benefits resource firm. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, let's turn it over to you first, Todd. Thank you very much, Molly. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, and uh, we really want to dedicate this call primarily to getting people's questions answered because we have we've had so many questions on previous versions of this that we just can't get through a meaningful share of them. So we hope we can get to that today. So I'll be very brief. Um, the big news that I want to make sure people are aware of is that uh, the, our push for getting more flexibility and the uh, forgiveness of the uh, PPP program uh, has now passed both the House and the Senate. Um, and so there will be more options for people uh, under that program now. They uh, uh, will have more than just eight weeks uh, to, to spend the funds to get it forgiven. They don't have to spend 75% uh, on payroll expenses. It's only 60%. And then finally, they'll have more time to pay back what, uh, what balance is left. So those are things we've been pushing for for a long time. There may be still be some tweaking that needs to be done of the bill itself in terms of what the language does, because there's some concerns about some drafting errors, but I'm confident we can get those fixed as well. Um, uh, and it's a difficult time because, of course, Congress is not fully operational either because they are operating remotely like, like many of the rest of us are. So there have been many, many challenges. Uh, but I do think it improves the program and approve, makes uh, some, some key changes for flexibility for, for folks that we've been asking for. Uh, so I want to make sure people are aware of that. We can add, well, I'm sure we're, we're going to get to more questions about how that would actually function uh, during the balance of the, of the program. Uh, but there are a couple other things that, are, that we're working on that I want to make sure people are aware of too and taking action on. One is the deductibility slash taxability of of the forgiveness funds. Uh, the original legislation specifically said that any any loan forgiveness would not be treated as taxable income, and it's not. But then the IRS said, "But guess what? You can't deduct the expenses that you're uh, that you're uh, uh, that are subject to that." So it, it's sort of a distinction without a difference uh, in a way. So uh, there is legislation moving in the House and Senate that I that I'm I, I'm hopeful we can get passed that will. Uh, make those forgiveness funds truly non-taxable as the tax writers originally intended. That'll make a significant difference in people's pocketbooks as well. Um, the other thing that's, that's happening, you may have all seen that uh, President Trump uh, issued an executive order uh, urging agencies to think about regulatory relief of various kinds. And so there's, I think there'll be a number of proposals floating out of the agencies for, for ways that they can they can reduce paperwork and uh, extend deadlines and, and do lots of other things to encourage economic growth. And that's gonna happen in fairly detailed ways from lots of agencies. Uh, and uh, I think that process is looking for input and feedback and guidance from the small business community as well. So I would encourage people to, to think about those things. What, what regulatory issues uh, most affect you and where could a real difference be made because if there's an opportunity now in the next few weeks and months to really address those. So those are the big things. I, I there's sort of the overview that I wanted to call people's attention to uh, before we get going and uh, I'll stop so we can have plenty of time for Q&A. Great. Thanks, Todd. Um, Marilyn, I'd like to kick it over to you uh, to give us a little bit more specificity on the PPP Flexibility Act and what that means for forgiveness. Thank you, Molly. And I think the big thing is what does it mean? A lot of people are trying to sort out what it's gonna mean for them. One, the it gives business owners the flexibility to fund a business plan that will work for their business. Some of the rules that have come out with the first version of PPP restricted their use of funds. It fits some businesses very well, and they've been able to use it, but not all businesses. So now with the new flexibility, 
What do you do now? Where do we go from here? And I've been talking to a lot of businesses around the country and it's the same advice I gave them in the very beginning, stop, breathe, survey the new landscape, assess the aftermath of the COVID pause of the protests, what's going on in your community. Some companies I've worked with use the eight weeks of the covered time to put employees to work on pivoting their company to a new model, new customers, new ways of delivering their product or service, and they may not need to extend the eight weeks and the law allows them to stay within that eight weeks because it worked well for them. Others can decide now, should, should they shift how the money is used and still seek forgiveness? They now can put as much as 60% toward payroll and that gives them more funds to put toward other expenses. That may better fit the new business plan that they have. Also, some of them may decide that a loan at 1%, that's fine and that it's better to use those funds on legitimate business expenses that'll move their business plan that's unique for them and let them grow and survive coming out of this rather than fitting their business to seek the formula for forgiveness. It's really clear in this new law, and I'm pleased to see it, that you are permitted to take this as a loan if you choose to. So now's the time to send out the scouts and to evaluate what the customers, the suppliers, and the methods of delivery look like and the timeline for your return for your individual business to return to sales and profit. Then use those funds to build out your business plan the way it was designed in the law so that you will survive and thrive coming out of this. Thanks, Molly. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, I think we have Keith on the line now. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn it over to you, Keith, switching gears. Uh, can you give us a quick overview of the things folks need to be aware of when it comes to employees and some of the key rule changes? Yeah. Well, first of all, the uh, uh, FFCRA remains in effect. It had an April 1st effective date, but it remains in effect all the way through the end of this year. So it provides for uh, 10 days of uh, paid sick leave, two weeks, and then another uh, 10 weeks of paid leave specifically for uh, child care related absences. And one of the things that is appropriate to think about now is that those absences have to be because the child's school or caregiver is unavailable due to uh, COVID-19 reasons, not because the uh, year the school year ended. So if the if the reason you need to take time off is because the school closed, uh, that's not going to entitle you to the paid leave. Uh, there's job restoration requirements for all those employers who are more than 25 employees up to the 500, uh, although uh, even those with under 25 have some obligations to keep an eye out for uh, an opening. The other piece of coming back to work is when you rehire, what should you be doing to ensure the safety and health of your employees? And uh, that is something that the CDC uh, and OSHA have uh, both chimed in on, uh, I would say that the likelihood of uh, OSHA difficulties are relatively small uh, for employers who do basic uh, safety, but it's uh, employees who may complain about that that are gonna be an issue for uh, many um, employers. Uh, there's also issues of workers' compensation and potential liability to um, as employees try to uh, get outside of, uh, get workers' compensation benefits or um, go outside of the workers' compensation system to recover from their employees. But uh, all of those things are complicated and I assume that uh, we'll probably get some questions about those. Great, thanks Keith. Um, Gary, there've been some key changes to benefits rules that can help small businesses and their employees. Uh, we've not spent a ton of time talking about those. Can you highlight some of the key changes folks should be aware of? There are actually quite a few and uh, they're gonna affect most small businesses, mid all businesses, really all employers. Um, I did wanna note in Todd's initial comments, I really enjoyed his comment that Congress was not operational. I thought that was gonna have a period <laughs> at the end of it but he explained during the, the COVID. Um, CARES Act made numbers of changes and then uh, in subsequent IRS notices that we've received over April and May, even more changes. So I'll try to hit these very quickly. 
Normally, if I'm prior to age 59 and a half or if I'm still an active employee, I'm not allowed to take a hardship distribution from my plan uh, without paying a 10% excise tax, an early distribution penalty. If I have one of five uh, COVID-related items, I may take during this year only a COVID, uh, it's called a CRD, COVID-related distribution up to $100,000 uh, of my, depending upon what my plan chooses, of my vested account balances in my 401k, profit sharing, any of my qualified retirement plans. Um, that is optional to the employer. The employer does not have to adopt it, but may. Also optionally, where plan loans, where they're allowed, uh, are only allowed up to a cap of $50,000 from my plan, during uh, 2020, again, optionally on the part of the employer, I can adopt loan provisions uh, of up to $100,000 for the same five COVID-related reasons. Uh, if I have not yet taken a required minimum distribution this year for 2020 only, RMDs are um, suspended. So I'm not required to take it, nor am I required to make it up in 2021 or beyond. Uh, one of the more complicated items uh, are we got a, out of IRS notices, pauses in all sorts of timelines that COBRA, for example, HIPAA special enrollment periods, the amount of time for health claim submissions uh, that they may be made. And the way I think of this is by hitting a pause button on the computer while I'm watching YouTube. Wherever I was in a timeline that began or ran into March 1st or later is paused until what's known as the end of the outbreak period, which is the uh, declaration of, of the end of the national emergency plus 60 days. At, the, at, the, at that end of the outbreak period, I hit unpause and continue my timeline. So for example, the 60 day, uh, uh, election period under COBRA. If I was at day 45 in my timeline come March 1st, at the end of the outbreak period, whenever that is, we don't know yet, I would unpause and I still have 15 days, similarly to make a COBRA payment, uh, to submit health claims or to make new elections due to a HIPAA special enrollment. Um, some positive changes that uh, NSBA has been advocating for now 10 years. Um, returning, it's kind of a back to the future, returning over-the-counter medications um, as eligible expenses. They no longer need a prescription. Uh, the employer could optionally require a prescription under the plan, but it's not necessary if they wish to get rid of it. Um, added to the list are menstrual products are now eligible expenses under the, um, under the CARES Act. And um, lastly, uh, a very important distinction, certainly as we've discovered uh, during the, the pandemic, telehealth and other remote care services um, are now allowed to be reimbursed <laughs> under a uh, high deductible health plan without having met the deductible. And the reason that's important is because if I offered telehealth with either no copay or a low copay with a high deductible health plan, that's considered a health plan that didn't have a high deductible. And therefore my HSA, I could not contribute to it, nor could my employer contribute to it if I was eligible. So this is a, a major change we've been talking about now for probably five, six years, and uh, it's now permanent. The last two items are permanent uh, in the CARES Act. Great, thanks Gary. And now what uh, the, the, meat, the meat and potatoes of, of our conversation today, and, and again, I know a lot of people are, are still getting logged on, so uh, I do apologize for the technical glitch we had at the start of the call and appreciate everybody's patience in trying to get logged on. We will make a live recording or a recording of this available to folks after the call, so if you, if you're, if you missed part of it, don't worry, we will email out the full webinar to everybody. So 
With that, I would like to go ahead and um, turn it over to questions. If you dialed in just by phone, if you press star nine, that will let me know that you have a question and I will come to you once we get through all of our emailed questions, which we did receive quite a few. So I would like to thank everybody for sending in those questions, which were um, really some great questions. I think we're gonna start first with a question from Anne Marie, and this is for you, Marilyn. And she asks, how is revenue considered during PPP loan period? In other words, if a small business has some revenue, albeit considerably less during the 60 day period following a deposit of the PPP funds, how will that be considered as part of the reconciliation? Very important question because we're so used to any borrowing being based on our revenue or our profits. What was unique to the payroll protection loan is the amount you awarded was based on payroll. So it does not have to do with revenue. The forgiveness is based on the use of those proceeds divided between payroll and the eligible expenses, not on the revenue you have. So it's enabling businesses to ramp up their revenue without risk of losing the benefits of the payroll protection loan. This was designed to help you with the expenses. Great, thanks Marilyn. Uh, we do have another question for you, Marilyn, and this is from Andrea, she asks, if you were approved and received a PPP for a small amount and need more help, can you reapply or can you apply for something else under the COVID-19 financial relief program? Good question. And I've been feeling a lot of questions like that. Under the payroll protection, it says one loan per company. However, because of the conflicting regulations and the way they came out in waves, there was one exception made when it first came out was based on payroll. Many companies who paid as partnerships paid it through a distribution to the partners. That was not included in the payroll. So they came back and corrected that and said that those individuals could add their normal pay as a distribution back into the amount and the a loan amount could be increased, not a new loan. So whether there will be some changes coming with this when the rules are written, remember the law is still to be signed and then the regulations will be written. And we saw the last time there were significant differences in the application when the regulations were written versus the way the law was written. So there may be some opportunity for expanding that ability to go back for an increase on the loan. Can you utilize other programs? Absolutely, and you should. And you should look to state, local, and other programs along the lines of what you need. It may not look like payroll protection and it may in the long run be a better fit for what you need to grow your business. Great, thanks Marilyn. The next question is for Keith and uh, Jackie asks, am I allowed to take temperatures of employees without viola violating the ADA? What about asking for proof of negative tests for those who previously had the illness or a positive test? Uh, both of those the EOC has said are permissible. Uh, you do need to be uh, concerned about the privacy of the employees. So there are some guidelines as to as you take the temperatures, you're not supposed to do it in front of everybody else um, to do it privately, but you are permitted to uh, do that. Uh, you're also permitted to verify that someone is no longer uh, carrying the virus uh, after they've tested positive or actually uh, suffered the disease. Great, thanks Keith. Uh, back to you, Marilyn. This question is from Michelle Annette and she asks, for sole proprietorships that are S-Corps, will doing the PPP loan forgiveness paperwork still be necessary? If you are a sole proprietor, and meaning you have an S-Corporation and you are the only entity, the only piece of that, you really are a corporation, not a sole proprietor. So we, let's divide those two. If you are a sole proprietor under this law, that's defined generally as filing a Schedule C in your tax return. And you apply by using what you use as your net profit line 31 of Schedule C of the tax return. If you are an S corporation, that means you're organized as a corporation and you have chosen an S selection that passes that net profit through to your personal tax return. As a corporation, you can be on the payroll. So you probably through the payroll protection would fill out the paperwork as the payroll. If you are a sole proprietor, you would fill it out using line 31 of your schedule C. You may choose not to apply for the payroll protection at all. You may have found other sources that are more beneficial to you, perhaps a state program or a local program and not need to apply for the payroll protection loan. But those are two different things, whether you're a sole prop or you under the law, or you are a corporation. Great, thanks Marilyn. 
The next question is for Gary, and this is from one of our anonymous um, uh, participants, and uh, they ask, why does it matter if telehealth or other remote care services can be reimbursed before an HDHP deductible is met? Well, pretty much as I um, tried to explain, the if I had any um, benefits other than preventive benefits paid under an HDHP health plan before I met the deductible, the high deductible, I was prohibited from getting an HSA contribution, either making my own or uh, my employer. Some employers uh, contribute to HSA. Uh, by removing telehealth as something that would disqualify the HSA contribution, that's one more hurdle that uh, employees and employers don't have to overcome anymore. Great. Thanks, Gary. I, I want to I stick with on that kind of theme because we just got a question in through the, um, through the, the Q&A platform, uh, and it's from Grace, and she asks, do you know if people without insurance will be helped with medical expenses? <laughs> um, I, I shouldn't laugh. Uh, there are tools that employers can offer where they don't offer group health plans. There's a, a prior to all of this, uh, in last year's uh, IRS, one of my, the IRS notices, they created something called an individual coverage health reimbursement arrangement, where I could now go out and purchase coverage on the exchange or just buy coverage anywhere, or if I was on Medicare, uh, pay for parts B and D, uh, and get reimbursed by my employer on a pre-tax basis. But other than that, there's nothing, unfortunately, nothing in the CARES Act or in any other uh, legislation or regulation that would address currently people without health coverage. Uh, one of the changes potentially is that you're not typically allowed to do, uh, but if your employer offers group health coverage, there is the possibility that the employer will now allow, even without a HIPAA special enrollment period, um, a mid-year change. I, do, I wouldn't have to wait for open enrollment. And so employers may wish to look at that, talk to their carriers about offering it and um, providing that as an alternative. But unfortunately, there's no uh, special federal program uh, that dealt or act that dealt with uh, those without currently without health coverage. Okay, thanks for that, Gary. Um, the next question is for Marilyn, and this uh, is another anonymous question. And they ask, "Can I apply and be approved for both the PPP as well as the PUA, which is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance? Uh, if so, how does that affect my business and tax status?" Very, very, very common question, and it really goes on a state by state basis. Many states did not permit the self-employed to collect unemployment insurance. Pennsylvania, where I'm headquartered, was one such state. So in preparation for this question, I went online to see what their Q&A talks about sole proprietors for the state of Pennsylvania. And the phrase they use is that it has to have been, the all work has to have been, have had to suspend their work. So the contradiction here is you're applying to qualify for PA unemployment, you have to certify you have suspended work. If you're applying for a payroll protection loan, you're implying you want to continue and survive and have a viable business going forward. So you really have to look hard at each state and its rules. Some states routinely allow sole proprietors. They have policies in place that make that possible. So the best place to start to answer that question is to go to your state um, question and answer section of their website on unemployment. Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, the next question comes from Kelly, and this is also for you, Marilyn, and she asks, I am an owner and solo operator of my business, and all of my clients have placed work on hold during the pandemic. I don't have paychecks for myself, but I take draws when I need the income. Can I apply for PPP? To date, I have probably lost in excess of $10,000, and it will continue for months, probably approaching closer to $15,000 by September. Yeah, absolutely. And fortunately, the, fortunately, the, the law was written to allow for the sole proprietors. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, the rules for them were written halfway through the first wave. And by the time they were eligible around April 3rd, 
the regulation still hadn't been written for how that was going to be done. And then the first wave of payroll protection money expired. When it came back, I was just talking to a colleague yesterday who had applied to his bank as a sole proprietor and they turned him down because he doesn't have payroll. The law clearly allows him to borrow. He's borrowing again his profit. You're gonna to go to your Schedule C you file on your tax return and look at line 31, your net profit. Now, if your net profit is zero because you have been aggressive with your expenses to reduce your tax liability, you're ineligible. But if you have a profit on line 31, you divide it by 12, multiply it by uh, 2.5, and that's the maximum amount you can borrow. But you do need to understand you're only forgiven for, well, this law will change that. It used to be you were only forgiven for eight weeks. So you were stuck with being proved for more than you could have forgiven. Now it looks like we'll see what the regs say when they come out, because the regs specifically reduced the eligibility timeframe for the owners. And I'm going to quote the reg on this. I didn't write this. They didn't want the sole proprietors to get a windfall. So I'm not quite sure what the regs will say when this comes out, but you are absolutely eligible if you show a profit on your Schedule C. Thanks, Marilyn. The next question is for Gary, and this is from Joanna. She asks, is there a reduction in the fees I'm charged for pulling money out of my retirement if due to a COVID hardship? Um, I'm not sure what the question refers to in fees. Uh, typically, the, the platform where the money's invested charges uh, distribution fees, loan fees, and I'm not aware of very many of those uh, being reduced or eliminated. As a matter of fact, I'm not aware of any of those. Um, if, if the question is referring to taxes, the answer is yes. The 10% uh, early withdrawal, early distribution excise tax is waived during this year only if the reason for the distribution is one of the five COVID-related distributions. Great. Thanks, Gary. Uh, this next question is for you, Marilyn. This is from Rick. Uh, he asks, if we have part-time farm help, can we still utilize the PPP with loan forgiveness? Is there any special dispensation for farmers? As far as under the CARES Act, it is open for farmers, which was not something they routinely could go to the SBA in the past. And again, they'd be using, instead of a Schedule C, they'd be using the Schedule F for farm. If they had payroll, then it would be as the owner and the payroll that they're showing on their Schedule F. They should, however, check with their farm credit bureaus. They probably have more availability, more flexible and better fit for them through their normal farm funding. There have been things done through the, the uh, USDA's BNI program, which is business and industry and the agricultural business. The idle loan was open only to farm related businesses for a period of time trying to give them access. So you can qualify, you may find other programs a better fit. Okay, thanks Marilyn. Um, one more for you, and I, I think you touched on this, but let's, let's um, focus on it again. Uh, what if you just started your business last year and you don't have any profits? How can you get a grant or a loan? Do you have to have documents for every loan and grant? Well, this is where it depends on the type of entity you are. If you are a corporation, whether it's a C Corp or an S Corp, or you are a LLC filing as a corporation and you have payroll, the payroll protection loan does not require that you have a profit. They don't even ask for check on that. They simply verify the amount you borrow based off of your payroll. If you are a sole proprietor, if you are a recipient of the 1099s, if you are a single member LLC and you file it through your Schedule C, unfortunately there you do have to show a profit or you don't get a distribution from the, from the law. So that's very simply, this is a case where the entities fall into two groups. And again, these were written, this was not written in the law. This was written in the regs that the SBA and the Treasury put out. So there can be changes. And that's, there have been in fact, for anyone if they're a little bit confused, just a little FYI for everybody, since the law was written, there have been 50 changes to the regs. Some of those changes are a paragraph and some of them are 41 pages long. So if it seems a little confusing, it has been. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, this next question is for you, Keith. This is from Robin and she asks, are there any guidelines or safe harbor protections currently in place for employers in bringing back employees to work? Um, Probably no safe harbor uh, provisions. The 
uh, there are guidelines and the uh, CDC has issued guidelines about uh, bringing employees back to work, including employees in retail establishments, office establishments, things like um, checking temperature before they come to work, checking temperature at work, hand washing, masks when there's any uh, contact uh, within six feet, barriers between uh, work locations and uh, work locations and where customers might be, uh, those kinds of things. OSHA has also issued guidelines for many of the um, industries that are out there. They're only the form of guidelines and not uh, regulations. Uh, but OSHA has uh, not been doing much in the way of citations. So that's probably a good thing for employers, but um, it would be well advised to take a look at the CDC guidelines uh, and the uh, OSHA uh, guidelines as you start up. Great. Thanks, Keith. Um, we do have a question. Um, we're starting to get questions in through our Q&A platform. So I'm going to start going through those. And I'm also getting some questions emailed to me. So uh, we're just going to kind of skip uh, back and forth between those. So um, the first question is from Grace, and I'm not 100% sure what, the, uh, what, what Grace is asking here. But she's at, she says, what about salaried employees? Um, so Grace, if you, if you want to re-ask that question and, and specify to what exact piece, um, that would be helpful. So um, go ahead and re-ask that question if you don't mind, and we'll move on to the next one. Um, this is an anonymous question, and it says, if we do not currently have a payroll prior to the COVID disaster, can we now hire people to assist in pivoting our business uh, to, to a new business model and apply for PPP with new employees? This will assist in hiring people to the company and being able to hire with a loan. Marilyn? Good question. Uh, they're very specific about when the business was in effect, and the, the magic date seems to be February 15th. I've seen nothing in the guidance that would give the lender the opportunity to lend against new payroll. However, this whole law was designed to put people to work. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's not other programs out there that would help fund that payroll as you're trying to grow unique. Many companies found they need less employees coming out of this. It would be good to see the funding go to businesses who have found ways for more employees coming out of this, but I have not seen anything in the guidance yet that would help in that particular case. Okay, thanks, Marilyn. Uh, this next question, I think, is another one for Marilyn. This is from Angie, and she says, Our office obtained the PPP loan, but we were also interested in the idle low interest loan. Does obtaining an idle loan make the PPP a loan? or make the PPP loan not eligible for forgiveness. Uh, I've seen some articles indicating that is the case, and I understand you can't use an IDA loan to pay payroll if you also receive the PPP. Can you please clarify? Sure, and first of all, for anyone who's trying to keep up with what's going on, there is a lot of misinformation out there. Not in many cases because people are intentionally misleading. I've had clients send me something, so I can't do this because, and the date of the information was March 26th, and the world has changed a lot since March 26th. Uh, when the idle loans first were available, and many people went for them, that was before all the rules had been written and the laws around the payroll protection. So the intent was when payroll protection came out that anything used for payroll roll into the payroll protection so they could more easily be in one place and all get the forgiveness. So when you apply for a payroll protection loan, they will ask if you had an idle loan, if you got those proceeds and the portion of those that were used for payroll they'll want to combine that with the payroll protection. Again, that's designed to get it all in one place for calculations for forgiveness and it's best for you. However, you can and many businesses are looking at the IDLE program for low interest rate loans, and they are loans, low interest rate loans that will enable them to spend on other things that are important to their business. There's nowhere in this that specifies that they have funds for the personal protective equipment that's gonna be required, the barriers, that Keith was talking about and all the uh, protective measures you're gonna take for your employees. So many small businesses are looking at the idle loan to provide that funding for them or their major costs may be, have to do with vendors or other things that they need to work with and that's what the idle is for. So there's no reason why you cannot have both. One thing to keep in mind though is the idle loan is an SBA loan and it will file a lien against all business assets if the loan is more than 25,000. And that's something to be aware of. It's a 30-year loan, and that lien will be in place for the entire length of the loan and three uh, years after. So think about that as you're going for the loan if you intend to have it out the full time. 
If I can add a, a one other comment to that, there were uh, what are called idle grants of up to $10,000. Yes. And that does affect, if you get an idle grant, uh, whether or not you actually take the idle loan that you might have applied for at the same time, the idle grants 10,000 will reduce by 10,000 the amount of forgiveness of the total PPP loan. And that's on the PPP application, forgiveness. Yeah. And that's when that first came out. That was not the intent. That was not part of what was out there before. And again, this is where the, and I, we were discussing the law now as it was passed. And when I first saw the regs that came out after the first law, it made some dramatic changes in what was the intent of the law. Part of the reason why we've had to have a second, some of the things that are in this legislation, put in legislation to offset what had been put in regulation that had hurt the program. Uh, it's kind of Congress having to tell the bureaucrats, this is what we meant now, we mean that we meant that and we want you to do it. So to Gary's point that the forgiveness app is an entirely another story and I am hoping and praying that what came out of this rule will cause them to scrap what they sent out with that and start over. Because having three tests for forgiveness and losing basically the forgiveness piece of that advance on your idle loan defeats what I believe was the purpose of this legislation in the beginning which was to enable businesses, particularly small businesses, to not just survive, but thrive when they come out of this. So I'm hopeful that we will see the pressure now on, and it seems Treasury has taken the lead. At one point, they sent the deputy treasurer over to clean up, quote unquote, the mess at the SBA. So I'm hopeful this will change and we'll see a, a fairer set of forgiveness rules with the application. Thanks, Marilyn, and thanks, Gary, for your uh, input as well. Um, the next question is uh, an anonymous question, and uh, they say, I have been subsidizing the company by having a reduced salary. I have the opportunity to secure a new customer, and this would enable me to raise my salary. When may I do so without impacting PPP forgiveness? Do you want me to take that one, Molly? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, because I see that frequently. There's nothing that prevents you, that restricts your PPP forgiveness by increasing your payroll. One of the things you have to be careful of though, when you're increasing your payroll as the owner, are you doing that at the expense of not bringing other employees back? Then you're gonna be sitting in front of Keith and trying to explain why you didn't bring an employee back and you chose to pay yourself more. One of the things I am concerned about for small businesses is many times when you're trying to do the most with the least amount of resources, the business owner steps in and works 80 hour weeks to get things done. Uh, bringing on a new customer, good for you and all of this. And obviously, to increase your payroll is logical. Uh, but if you do that at the expense of not rehiring or not bringing other people back, at the way the forgiveness rules are written now, you will, be in, you will run into a problem with that. They refer to payroll as being usual and customary. Uh, so keep that in mind. You may end up having to pay yourself a bonus when your covered period's over. The other thing to keep in mind there too is that there is a an annualized hundred thousand dollar limit on payroll to any individual owner non owner, and so if depending upon where you reduce you know what you reduce your payroll to and what you want to increase it to, the most you can claim during what was the eight week period uh, was fifteen thousand eight thirty five, which is a hundred thousand uh, divided by fifty two times eight. Uh, with the new 24 week, one of the questions we're going to have is what happens to the $100,000 limit if I have a 24 week coverage period? Uh, do I annualize that as 2450 seconds now? Uh, since it, just, it hasn't even passed. It's passed the uh, Congress, but the president, uh, as of the start of this, had not yet signed it. And what businesses need to keep in mind is the law did not limit the amount you can pay to 100,000. It limited the forgiveness to 100,000. The only issue you will run into is if you bring back folks, pay them more, and don't bring back, have a reason. I had a client call and said, I want to bring, I had somebody that had been a 1099, want to bring her in as an employee, full-time nurse practitioner, because she can see a wide range of clients. Instead of bringing three people back part-time, her skills can apply across the board. And I said, then document your reason completely, carefully, why this makes sense for the business, why you're doing it. And he said, and by the way, she's also uh, my partner's wife. I said, then you put a big file together on this one. 
Um, and because the, they have said in the regs when they came out on the forgiveness application, yes, they are not going to audit anything, any loan amount under $2 million, but they were very clear in the regulations that they intend to review and look at anything that they see as unusual. So start a file. If it makes good common sense for your business, the law is not telling you you can't run your business the way you want to run it. Just be prepared to explain why you did that and perhaps not hire back five other people. And the uh, substituting you as an owner uh, for employees that you used to have can get you a skew of the uh, full-time equivalent tests mm -hmm. for the uh, loan forgiveness, which are far too complicated for me to understand. But um, it, it is, uh, you know, if, if you don't get people back, uh, you're running into a problem with the forgiveness piece of the loan. And I'm hoping with the changes in the new law that they don't want to punish people for if you can't hire the same people back at the same pay or the jobs have changed and there's more room in this. I'm hoping that we get more release in the regulations around the, the FTE equivalents. Yes. Great. Um, we're going to move on to the next question from uh, Michael, and he asks, if we've adjusted payroll costs or planned rehires based on the previous thresholds and deadlines, but now have more time after incurring costs we otherwise would not have, is there anything we are able to do to increase or recoup those funds? I think that's a, that's a tough spot many companies are in. They followed the rules they were given at the time. And that was the analogy I used in the beginning. Some people said, I don't have work for my employees right now, but I'm required to, to bring them all back. And when I was working with my clients, I said, then find something meaningful for them to do. And many of them then pivoted. They put the people through training to get certification. So when they came out, they could do different kinds of work. They put them to work on marketing plans and so forth. And then the eight weeks were up. And in some cases they weren't open again and they're looking at laying those people off again. And unless there's some provision to allow for a second advance to the same company, at this point, there wouldn't be anything they could do. They would need to look for other programs. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question is from Bonnie and she asks, when listing payroll items, are federal and state taxes included as an allowed item? And do you list them separately in your record keep them, keeping? Is this for the forgiveness? I believe so, yes. Yeah, uh, no, the federal taxes are excluded um, from the, the amount of the payroll. You're allowed to put benefits in, so it's what you paid the employees, and it's also all the benefits for health, vision, pension, anything normal and customary during that eight-week period. Uh, actually, that raises an interesting question that I've been asked um, a number of times related to retirement plan contributions. Yep. The law as it initially passed, if you read the law, it says paid and incurred during the eight week coverage covered period. The regulation says, and the loan app, uh, forgiveness application says paid or incurred. So we had tons of clients call and say, can I make my 2019 match and profit sharing contribution during the eight week covered period before it was extended to 24 weeks right. and have it count. And in the guidance we have so far, and I'm not going to suggest that this is final because Treasury seems to change its mind every other day about things, I could actually do that. I could make my 2019 match and profit share and have it count towards payroll costs up, well, for rank and file employees or corporate employees, if I'm a C Corp, I could have it count all the way up. I could theoretically make my contribution for all of 2020 during the eight week period, project it out and have it count towards payroll costs. For my owner employees, whatever that means, uh, Treasury has not yet defined it, the SBA has not yet defined it. There's a tax code section in the retirement area that does define owner employees, sole props, partners in a partnership, uh, sub S corps. Um, for them, that hundred thousand dollar cap I referred to earlier is fifteen thousand eight thirty five, includes health premiums and retirement contributions. Where for everybody else, it's an addition to the hundred thousand cap. 
So you're going to want to talk to your CPA and advisor uh, and closely follow what is going to change in regulations after the passage of the PPPFA. Okay. Thanks. Um, the next question is an anonymous uh, attendee, and they ask, if my organization has received additional funds, uh, grants, et cetera, that would cover my payroll and other expenses, can I use the PPP funds I have received for startup, startup expenses for 2021? I know it would not be forgivable, but would it be legal to use and then pay off within the five-year period, or should I just return the PPP? <laughs> Molly, read, let's try that question again slowly for me. Okay. There's a lot of moving parts in that question. It is. Sorry about that. Uh, if my organization has received additional funds that would cover my payroll and other expenses, and they put in parentheses grants, et cetera, can I still use the PPP funds I have received for startup expenses for 2021? I know it would not be forgivable, but would it be legal to use and then pay off within the five-year period? Two answers to that question. One would be if you have payroll and you spend payroll, then you would be smart to claim the payroll as how you use the loan proceeds. But the second piece of that is if you received other money and didn't need it for the payroll, then you run across the rule that was placed, sent out that said, this was one of the subsequent rules that came out the initial application, you have to justify that you needed the funds and did not have access to other resources. So if you had access to other resources, whether it was grants or other funds, and didn't need it for payroll, and your application happens to be picked up and reviewed at time of forgiveness, you may be deemed that it was ineligible and it would become a loan anyway, if they didn't have greater questions because you, they're saying you didn't need the money. Many companies, though, look at it as we do have payroll. We are uncertain about the ability to continue that, that payroll. We don't know that our customers will continue to pay us. We don't know what the market is going to look like. So they borrowed that money intentionally for payroll. If things got better and they were able to secure other funds, either through more customers or grants, and able to do other things to position themselves to come out of it, there's nothing illegal with that. But the loan was intended to pay for payroll when the companies couldn't, and they will be looking at that. Yeah, to, pay, to play devil's advocate for a minute, I'm not required to file a forgiveness application. Correct, correct. So I can say, I'm, I took it as a loan. We've told clients uh, when they've asked, they should have created a file, and if they didn't uh, create one, with notes documenting why they felt at the time of the application for the loan, the PPP loan, why they felt business conditions were uncertain because that was two months ago and things have definitely changed. And, you know, in this question, um, I may not have known that I was going to pick up a new client two months later. And so we've suggested um, actually writing notes to a file of why I felt uncertain uh, at the time I certified that I, uh, I was uncertain. Correct. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind too, the first reading of this law and this bill it's not clear if the new reduced requirement for 60% payroll is a guideline or a cliff. So, and if in fact, if you don't spend 60% on payroll and that's a cliff, there is no forgiveness. But then again, it also makes clear in this law, which I think is wonderful, that you clearly can be alone. Up to this point, that was uncertain because when the guidance came out from Treasury and said 75% must be on payroll, no more than 25% on these specific other expenses, that equals 100%. So what was unclear was what happens if you didn't spend it the way it had been specified, would there be some penalty? This law makes it pretty clear that there's not. It was intended to be used for certain things for forgiveness and others as could be used as a loan. And I think that's a great point, Gary, in that there are many people looked at this, their biggest expense might not be payroll. And they saw this as a wonderful opportunity to enable the company to survive. It, their biggest expense might be insurance. It may not be the rent in some cases. So this was a way for them to survive. And I, I think the um, view of Congress is that despite what they actually wrote, that they did not intend it to be a cliff. And I think uh, Senator Rubio is Correct. in touch with the White House to encourage them to 
uh, make it clear that it is uh, gradual. And if you had 59 and a half percent go to payroll, you should be forgiven for 59 and a half percent. And actually, the first forgiveness application, which I don't believe will be the final one, so don't start filling that out just yet. Um, if your if your eight weeks is just about up, um, actually does say that that uh, you would re you would in essence divide your payroll eligible payroll costs by initially 0.75 to determine the maximum forgiveness amount. When you got to the reduction, if you reduced FTEs or if you reduced wage or salary in the two uh, requirements under the original act, then you had to, it, again, was not a cliff, but then you had to do a reduction in forgiveness. Okay. Um, I did want to mention to folks on the call, I know we're nearing the um, uh, one o'clock hour, but I have talked to most of our uh, speakers. I'm sorry to put you on the, on the spot, Gary, but I'd like to extend this an additional 10 minutes. We're still getting some really great questions. Um, and I, I think most of you can join us if you're able to, to stick around for another 10 minutes. We'll try and get through more of these questions. Um, and, and again, I apologize for the uh, tech issues we had at the start of the, the uh, call. So um, if you're able to stay on, please do. If not, feel free to download the, the webinar um, once we get it posted later this afternoon. Um, let me move over to another question. This is from Taylor, and, and this is a complicated one. So, um, and that's something I think uh, Keith, Keith Gary and Marilyn can all um, respond to. Um, Taylor asks, if an LLC has two members, 50-50, uh, one of the owners is set up as an employee of the LLC, but the business doesn't have a company health insurance policy. The owner does take distributions out to pay for health insurance through the other 50% member slash spouse's policy that is employed elsewhere. Does this count as a health insurance expense for the PPP forgiveness since the sole proprietor is using business funds for her uh, or his health insurance expense and can document the payment to the health insurance company via the spouse's employer? Let me take a crack at the first part of the 12 part question. Um, <laughs> depending upon how the LLC is taxed is gonna determine the answer. If I'm taxed as a corporation, I'm gonna have one answer. If I'm taxed uh, as a partnership, there's going to be a separate answer. Under the PPP, group health premiums are eligible as a payroll cost in calculating towards the forgivable expense, uh, forgivable payroll expense. Since in the beginning of the question, you said there was not group health coverage, the initial answer and the answer if you're an LLC taxed as a partnership is no, that will not count. If your LLC is taxed as corporation, and you establish one of these brand new in 2020 individual coverage HRAs, health reimbursement arrangement, there is an argument to be made that the employer contribution to the ICHRA that then is reimbursed to the employee that went out and bought individual health coverage, you may be able to make an argument that that is payment towards a group health premium. But it's going to be that very narrow case, and it's going to depend on how you're taxed. Oh, I apologize. I was muted. Um, thanks for that, Gary. I'd like to turn over to a question um, from the Q&A, which, is, which uh, I, I think is probably a good question for you, Marilyn. And um, Julio asks, what documents should be submitted to request forgiveness for a sole proprietor slash independent contractor who requests the PPP loan under the net income of Schedule C? Also, is it true that one should make checks to oneself for this purpose? Good question, good question. Because you're not normally set up for payroll, what I have recommended to the clients that I work with who file through a Schedule C is you know, write a check out of the company, write it to yourself. Now, normally you would use that profit for other things. Some of it goes to you, some of it goes for other things in the business. It's nothing to prevent you at the end of the, of the uh, covered period to either loan the money back to the company uh, or make other arrangements to do that because most self-employed do not spend 100% of the profit 
on themselves. That's just the way businesses work. But that's a good way to document that the money came out every, every week or at every month, and then you paid yourself for that. The other thing is you are allowed that rest of the funds to go toward other eligible expenses. Gentleman I spoke with yesterday has a small office. He pays rent, so he's able to do that. I don't know if this will stay in the regs, but when the forgiveness application came out, one of the good things it added that had not been there before was that you could claim transportation expenses. So if you have normal transportation, you're a contractor, you've got a truck and it's something and you pay for to deliver goods and the materials or rock or stone or whatever it happens to be, and you use that as an expense on your Schedule C, that's a legitimate expense that you can use. So look hard at what you filed for as expenses on your Schedule C. If you pay for any of those, those are the documents that you're need, gonna need to present however the new forgiveness application is written. Great, thank you. Um, the next question I wanna um, go to is from Andrea and um, she says, if we provided temporary positions with the PPP funds originally planned for the eight weeks, can we extend those new hires for an additional five weeks, not going the full 24 weeks without penalty? Also, is it okay to exceed the 60% in our payroll cost allocations? I can take a crack at that. The law was not designed to limit you how much you could pay on right. payroll. So if you're increasing payroll, go for it. Absolutely go for it. If you brought in some temporary positions and those are working out for you and you want to continue them, there's no reason why they should stop just because the covered period stops. Or, and if those are good for your business, there's no reason for them to stop simply because you ran out of payroll protection money. There should be revenue then coming in that would pay for those parties to continue. If the only reason you brought them in was to create payroll to meet the forgiveness, then you may have some questions to answer when that application gets picked up and reviewed. I don't know if the rules will change on this, but the way it's set now, you will apply to your bank for forgiveness, submit all the documents, they will approve the forgiveness, submit it to SBA to review. But good for you if you found a way to bring more people on. If you brought them on for a project where you thought the, the economy was gonna pivot and it's not working out, then you would do the same as you would do in the normal course of business. If you thought there was work for people and you hired them and the work isn't there, you lay them off, but be prepared for the repercussions that come with laying off employees. Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, the next question is from Lisa and it should be a quick one. Um, she said, I did get the idle, but I have not gotten approval for the PPP. I thought the PPP was guaranteed. No. Um, the, the idle loan is not guaranteed either. I've had clients who have been declined for the idle loan because they were unable to verify information. I don't have, I'm not, it appears that the uh, SBA is using the IRS um, transcript, quick transcript to verify numbers. And so if they filled out the idle loan in a hurry and were not careful to pick up exactly the numbers that are on their tax return, I'm having some people run into problems with that. There was no direct tie. You got the advance when you apply for a NIDA loan, that's the part that was automatic, whether you got approval or not. The payroll protection loan was separate, and that's coming through the, the lending community and the separate rules written for PPP. Great. Thanks, Marilyn. I think we'll have time to take two more questions, and then we'll um, close, the, close the webinar. Um, Gary, I think this is a question for you, uh, and it's at, been asked by a couple of people. Um, they said, what are the five COVID criteria regarding IRA distributions? Um, for IRAs and uh, defined contribution plans, and it, so 401k, profit sharing, 403b, and others, the five are you've been diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 or SARS COVID-2 uh, by a test approved by the CDC, that's one. Two is your spouse or a dependent is diagnosed with those by a test approved. Three is you experience adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, furloughed, laid off, or having your work hours reduced due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, you experience, uh, four is you experience adverse financial consequences of being unable to work due to lack of childcare uh, due to COVID-19. So I'll reiterate one of Keith's earlier comments, not because I have to stay home because school's out on summer recess, but when school was still in or my daycare center was still available and then it had to shut down. That's the fourth. 
And the fifth is um, you experience adverse financial consequences uh, as a result of your business closing or reducing hours that you own or operate due to COVID-19. So in order to get the um, COVID-related distribution during this year, those uh, the distribute the CRD or the um, uh, plan loan with a higher limit, I have to have one of those five and I have to self-certify that I have one of those five um, conditions. Great. Thanks, Gary. Um, we did get some clarification for one of our first questions. This is from Grace, and she says, on the previous webinar, it was mentioned all 40-hour-a-week employees will be included on payroll criteria for repayment or forgiveness. Does that include salaried employees like me and my husband? Anyone who's on payroll counts, and where some of the confusions come in is this full-time equivalent. When the forgiveness application came out, they have to calculate it by employee, so a, full, a salaried employee would be counted as one, even if they work like an owner, 50 hours a week or 60 hours a week, they're still only counted as one. But it, they do count. Hourly employees, it's a matter of converting their time to the equivalent of a 40 hour week following the federal rule for that, not some of the state rules. So yes, if they're on payroll, they count. If they're not on payroll, they don't count. Salary counts if they only work 10 hours a week. Correct. They give them as one. Because right. they're exempt, uh, the number of hours. They would count as a one. Right. Okay, great. Um, thanks for, for answering all those questions. And, and I, I know that we still have some more questions, and we will do our best to try and answer those via email. Um, I'd like to quickly turn to each of our, our speakers for any quick parting thoughts. Um, Marilyn, do you want to start? Sure. And I, what I'd like to end with is, I think the law has given us some great new flexibility and it's up to the business owner to determine what they need. Don't be driven just by forgiveness as all of us have echoed at this point. If it's a legitimate business use, it'll move you forward, but do stay posted for changes because we have not yet seen the regs written with the new law. And many times they can veer in a different direction. So do stay posted with this and be patient with your banks because I say I get the same notice as the banks get, and I have gotten all 50 changes, and sometimes, and they arrive at 11 o'clock at night, and we're trying to answer questions, and there's a lot of misinformation out there because the banks have disseminated this down, trying to deal with as many people as they can, and the worst information is coming from people who did not have a loan officer before, and they're asking branch pers personnel who may or may not have the latest up-to-date briefing. So stay tuned. This is a good source. Stay with NSBA. <coughs> Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, Keith, any parting thoughts? Yeah, don't be too patient with your bank. Uh, if you're too patient, they'll just, just string you out uh, indefinitely. But uh, I would also echo Marilyn's thought that keep on, uh, keep on top of what's happening and weigh in on uh, what's good for you and your business because um, NSBA itself can use the input and can be very strong in uh, advocating for what is necessary to make all these programs get the maximum benefit for the economy. And as you bring back employees, uh, just you know, use the common sense that uh, most small businesses use all the time um, and you'll be fine. Thanks for that, Keith. Uh, Gary, any, anything for the good of the order? No, I think the, you know, the comments Marilyn and, and Keith made I'm gonna actually provide a little sympathy to banks. Um, unbeknownst to most small business owners, whenever you now file for forgiveness, they have a 60 day clock that starts that they have to provide either an, uh, uh, that they approve the forgivable uh, amount or they don't. And so my guess is if you remember what happened when the loan window opened to apply for loans and how the systems were backed up and. Uh, many of the bankers I know in my small community uh, bank were working uh, 16, 18 hour days. It felt good that they could feel what, what we all feel as small business owners, uh, but they were working over the weekends and everything else. I do have some sympathy for them. I think the, my parting message would be the last chapter in all of this has not yet been written. Uh, we're going to get much more regulation. I am very hopeful we get more uh, legislation 
uh, Todd alluded early in the opening remarks that uh, the IRS came out with a notice um, that basically made the PPP loan just a cash flow tool. It would have no tax difference to any business owner uh, if the part of the forgivable loan is not deductible. And it actually raises issues that Treasury hasn't even thought about yet. There's a 10% excise tax on retirement plan contributions that are non-deductible. So if part of my PPP cost was retirement expense, you mean I have to pay a 10% excise tax because that part is non-deductible to the organization? There's lots more to be done. I'd encourage all of you to provide input to the NSBA of how this is uh, impacting you and your business. And NSBA has been wonderful at um, lobbying hard on these issues and getting some of these changes through both uh, the regulatory uh, entities and Congress. Great. Thanks, Gary. And uh, Keith, Keith, Gary, and, and Marilyn, we certainly appreciate um, the, uh, the NSBA pitches. Uh, we'll, we'll take it. Um, with that, Todd, I'd like to turn it over to you for any final thoughts. Yeah, I'd like to just reiterate all the thoughts we just heard, and, and especially to, to thank uh, Marilyn, Gary, and Keith for the time and their wisdom, both on this call and, and at other times as well. Um, you know, they're volunteers of the organization, and I think that they demonstrate greatly the, the power of being involved in an organization like NSBA. I mean, they're uh, leaders in our organization, but fundamentally they're members of the organization and have been for years. And uh, it's, it's, our, it's our power combined as we share information that makes uh, that so powerful. Um, finally, I'd just kind of like to say to people that um, uh, the, the changes to the programs at one level, I think, have been really frustrating for people because it's hard to keep up with um, and businesses are trying to make decisions on an ongoing basis. Uh, and we share that frustration. On the other hand, for the most part, as we've moved forward, the changes have mostly been good. We've mostly been able to make corrections and do and, and uh, uh, change things for the better for folks. Sometimes too late, unfortunately, for some companies, but still changes for the better. So uh, with that in mind, I, I do want to also reiterate what, uh, what uh, Keith and Gary said, which is continue to tell us your stories. We need to know what problems you're facing so that we know how we can address them and what are the priorities to address going forward. So um, stay in touch and uh, we'll do the same and uh, we'll continue to make sure we share the best information possible. And thanks for joining us. Thanks, Todd. And thanks again to each of our speakers and all the participants for your input, uh, questions, time, and also your patience today. Uh, we will be posting a webcast of this webinar later, so please check back at www.nsba.biz and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at NSBA Advocate. We know this is a really difficult time you're facing now, and uh, we want you to know that we're in this fight with you. Stay safe and be healthy. Bye.